Hey friends, welcome to another Q&A video on this channel. I'm your host, R.L. Solberg, and this channel exists to help us understand and address false teachings about Christianity, especially the idea that all Christians, including Gentiles, are required to keep the law of Moses. This is the theology of Torahism, which you may know as Hebrew roots or, or Torah observant Christianity. And our mission is to defend the biblical roots of Christianity and systematically break down teachings that challenge the sufficiency of Christ. Now, I get a lot of questions from our viewers and readers, and, and today I want to specifically answer three of them. Well, at, at least we'll discuss them in enough, in enough depth to hopefully bring a little clarity. And we're going to talk about Torah obedience in the last days, the 10 lost tribes of Israel, and whether some of us have descended from those tribes, and the idea that Paul was the founder of Christianity. And I'm also going to throw in a bonus question at the end. And to make things easy, I'll include a link directly to each of these questions in the description below. So, let's jump in. The question about keeping the Torah in the last days came from a few of you, actually. Built on Truth asked, how would you approach Old Testament texts that speak on Torah observance in the last days? And Brandon Davis wrote, I'd like to see a dive into the feasts, their significance, and why Hebrew Roots Movement people say that true children of God will be required to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot on Jesus' return. So, how would I approach those Old Testament texts? Well, I would approach them head on. So let's take a look. Zechariah 14 is probably the most commonly cited passage on this topic. And in this chapter, the, cha the prophet Zechariah is talking about the coming day of the Lord. The chapter begins by saying, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. And this is a phrase used throughout the prophets to refer to that future time when God will intervene in human affairs and judge the wicked and bless the righteous. Zechariah 14 uses the imagery of the triumphant return of Israel's king. And so this is end times prophecy, eschatology. And in this chapter, Zechariah speaks of, of battles and plagues and panic and so on. And then there's this passage starting at verse 16. Then everyone who survives all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths which is the Torah feast that in Hebrew is called Sukkot. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to, to keep the Feast of Booths. So this passage is pretty adamant that the nations will be keeping the Feast of Booths in the last days. And for our Hebrew Roots friends, this becomes a proof text that in the last days, the Torah will be kept. And before we un start unpacking that, let's look at one more passage from Isaiah 66. This is more end times prophecy, talking about the, the final judgment of the Lord. And again, we see a cosmic battle scene. So picking up at verse 15, it says this, For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. And then here's the verse that our Hebrew Roots friends often cite to support their belief that even in the end times, the law of Moses will be kept. Verse 17, those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, following one in the midst, eating pig's flesh and the, and the abomination and the mice, will come to an end together, declares the Lord. So here, our Hebrew Roots friends believe they found proof that in the last days, the kosher food laws will still apply because eating pigs and mice is, is forbidden in the Torah. And this passage shows that in the last days, people will still be judged for it. So for those of us who don't believe that the law of Moses is in effect under the new covenant, how do we deal with passages like this? How do we harmonize these passages 
which appear to show Torah laws in effect in the last days with our belief that those things are not required of Christians today. And honestly, we need to tread carefully here. And that's true no matter which side of this issue we're on, right? We can't look at the mention of the Feast of Booths in the end times and automatically jump to the conclusion that the entire law of Moses will be required. And we also, we can't simply dismiss the mention of the feast as allegorical or spiritual in nature, right? And here's the truth about end times prophecies. No one knows exactly what they mean except God because these things haven't happened yet. They're future events. So we can all affirm that these prophecies are true. They will happen. But the question is, in what sense will they happen? So any eschatological discussion about end times prophecy, no matter how well educated or or spiritually inspired we are, is a matter of human interpretation and, and speculation and theories, right? And we won't know who was right until these events actually happen. And you know, my gut tells me that when these events do happen, we'll all have fallen terribly short of what God has planned. Now, because these are future events doesn't mean that we can't have opinions on them. It doesn't mean we shouldn't comb through Scripture and try to understand what those last days might be like. But I think it does mean that we shouldn't be dogmatic about it. These are future events, and our position on them isn't a matter of salvation, and it has little to do with how we live out our faith in Jesus daily by loving God and loving people. So we need to approach Scripture prayerfully and humbly and thoughtfully because for those of us who accept the entire Bible as the inspired Word of God, we can't throw any of it out or claim that any of it isn't important. So a good rule of thumb when it comes to hermeneutics, to to interpreting texts like the Bible, is to interpret difficult passages in light of clear passages. In other words, our interpretation of ambiguous or cryptic texts, like end times prophecies, needs to be based on the teachings established in the straightforward passages of the Bible. Our understanding of the tricky texts can't violate what clear passages say, right? So, with that in mind, let's take a look at these two prophecies. There are some who believe we should read everything in Scripture literally unless or until we have a reason not to. So, let's work our way through this passage and ask some questions and see how literally we can take it. It says, starting at verse 16, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. So, Zechariah here is referring to the great battle he had just described and the plague that will befall the nations. But apparently the nations will not be completely wiped out. There will be survivors because Zechariah says that everyone who survives shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. So, should we read this prophecy as saying that literally everyone alive on planet Earth from every nation will travel to Jerusalem for this feast? (laughs) Good luck getting a hotel room. And Zechariah goes on to say, And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Okay, so if we take this literally, it means that some families won't go up to Jerusalem and there'll be no rain on them. And if we take the idea of families and rain literally, what does that look like? Will there be some neighborhoods where rain falls on only some of the houses and the yards of the families who didn't visit Jerusalem will be brown and dry? Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. Okay, so this verse sheds a little more light for us, right? The fact that he says family of Egypt suggests that Zechariah is not using the word families literally. He's not talking about a social unit of people related by blood or marriage, like parents and children and aunts and uncles and so on. So then the phrase families of the earth in verse 17 seems to be more of a metaphor for the nations, right? And verse 19 bears that out. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. So 
The expectation here is that all the nations on earth, especially Egypt, will go up to Jerusalem once a year to keep the Feast of Booths. Now, does Zechariah mean that literally? Will all the nations be able to physically fit in Jerusalem at the same time? Or, or, or maybe the population of the world will have, will have been dramatically reduced because of the end time battles. Or maybe the size of Jerusalem will be expanded by then to accommodate the, the population of the entire planet. And for those that don't go up to Jerusalem, will there literally be no rain within the geographic boundaries of their country? Well, what about the countries where some people go up to Jerusalem and others don't? Or does this prophecy maybe contain some metaphors and symbolism? I mean, could Zechariah maybe be talking about representatives from each nation showing up in Jerusalem each year rather than every single citizen? And is he literally talking about rain, like water falling from the sky? Or could he be talking figuratively about God's blessing on those nations? Now, I'm asking a lot of questions, but I think you get the sense of what I'm saying here. If we want to interpret this prophecy with the sort of wooden literalism, it leads to absurdity. If every person on earth will literally travel to the city of Jerusalem and literally celebrate the Feast of Booths, and if literal rain will stop falling from the sky on families who didn't make the trip, the prophecy kind of starts to sound like a farce. So I think we need to leave room here for some level of, of metaphor and symbolism. I mean, the prophecy is true, of course, but not in a strict, literal sense. Now, where we draw the line between what is symbolic or metaphorical and what is more literal, th that can be a matter of honest debate between reasonable believers. Could this prophecy mean that in the last days, all the nations will worship the Lord and enter into His ways, and those who don't will lose out on His blessing? Perhaps, sure. But let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that this prophecy is talking about the literal keeping of the Feast of Booths, that all the nations of the earth will keep that Torah feast in the last days. Now, if that's true, what would it mean for followers of Jesus today? Would it mean that we're under the entire law of Moses? No, this prophecy doesn't even suggest that. It only mentions one feast. It doesn't say that the law of Moses will be kept, or that any of the other Torah feasts will be celebrated, or that there would be a temple or a priesthood or, or any of the other Mosaic requirements. In fact, because of what the New Testament teaches, we know it can't mean those things. For example, if the Mosaic sacrifice for the atonement of sin, which was required in Leviticus 16, will be renewed in the end times, it would make the book of Hebrews false, which says there is no longer any offering for sin because the sacrifice of Jesus was once for all. So could it mean that Christians might want to keep Sukkot today so that we're ready for it in the end times? I don't know. I think even that's a bit of a stretch. If we want to take it, if we want to take it literally, I think the most we can derive from this passage is that in the last days, we will be celebrating the Feast of Booths. That's it. And in the meantime, today, according to the teachings we find in Acts 15 and in Romans 14 and Colossians 2 and elsewhere, we're not obligated to keep any of the Torah feasts. We're permitted to keep them if we want, but they're not required of us. So what about Isaiah 66 and the prophecy about being judged for eating pigs and mice? Well, Isaiah's prophecy is even more packed full of symbolism and imagery, and I just love the way this book is written. It's so beautiful, even just as literary art. So let's look at our passage starting at verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Such drama and energy in these words. But... Is Isaiah talking about literal fire here? I mean, will the Lord return amid burning material and flames and, and rebuke people by literally throwing fire on them? And will he literally be standing like a man in a chariot, you know, a two-wheeled platform pulled by horses? And will those chariots resemble a literal whirlwind, a mass of air that's rotating rapidly and advancing? Or... 
is Isaiah creating this striking imagery by pulling symbols from the culture around him to try and describe the power and swiftness and, and energy and fury of the Lord at the final judgment. Verse 16, And for by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, again with the fire, and by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. So is the creator of the universe going to be literally swinging a sharp metal weapon violently through the air, cutting down human beings? Or again, is, is Isaiah using compelling imagery pulled from his contemporary surroundings to paint a picture of the power and fear and pain and finality of God's final judgment? I mean, this is definitely a true prophecy, but it's not being communicated in a literal manner. For one thing, God isn't a man, right? This is anthropomorphism. And it strains credulity to imagine the living God's glorious entrance in the final days would be constrained to the, to the tiny platform of a literal chariot and his final cosmic judgment would be delivered at the edge of a three-foot blade. And a couple verses later, we read about how God will send the survivors out to declare his glory among the nations. Verse 20, And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and on dromedaries to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. So is Isaiah listing the literal forms of transportation that will be used in the end times to, to bring people to Jerusalem? Will it be on camels and mules? Well, it certainly could be. Could it be on planes, trains, and automobiles? Possibly, yes. And if that were the case, it wouldn't make Isaiah's prophecy wrong. My point is that prophets, like every other human being, are products of their time and culture. Not only are their words and symbolism constrained to the language and symbols that they know, but more importantly, the hearers of these prophecies were constrained in the same way. I mean, God had a word to give to the ancient nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. So naturally, that information had to be delivered in a language and using imagery and symbolism that ancient Israel would understand. I mean, if Isaiah stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, in the last days your brothers will be brought to my holy mountain on airplanes, trains, helicopters, and automobiles. <laughs> no one would even have a clue what he was talking about. I mean, the ancient Hebrew language didn't even have words for any of those things. So if Isaiah wanted to communicate the idea that, that people would be brought to Jerusalem using every known form of transportation, he would get that point across by listing all the forms of transportation known at the time, right? And what Isaiah's audience knew was fire and chariots and swords and camels and mules and so on. This was the world they lived in. And God knew that when he gave Isaiah this prophecy to share. Okay, so with that perspective in mind, let's take a look at this final verse in our passage, verse 17. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens, following one in the midst, eating pig's flesh and the abomination and mice, shall come to an end together, declares the Lord. So this is a, a pretty mysterious verse. Who's Isaiah talking about here? What gardens? Is he referring to literal gardens? Well, some commentaries suggest that gardens is a reference to offering sacrifices to idols, which would align with Isaiah's next phrase about eating unclean foods, right? Pigs and, and mice and the abomination, whatever that refers to. So the prophet's describing a wicked people who are openly disobeying Yahweh's commands. Now, does he literally mean that in the end times, pigs and mice will be considered unclean food? One of my regular viewers, Jeff, sure thinks so. Isaiah 66, 15 through 17 is a serious last day's warning about those who eat unclean. Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. Either Isaiah was a false prophet or pastors today are wrong about the unclean becoming clean. So is Jeff right about this? Are these the only two options when interpreting, interpreting uh, Isaiah 66? Or... Could the prophet have been using symbols from the Hebrew culture he lived in to describe wanton disobedience to the will of God? At the time God gave Isaiah this prophecy for Israel, these were visceral images of disobeying Yahweh. 
And again, if we want to take everything in this passage literally, that would have to include the chariots and the swords and the camels and the mules and so on. But if those things are at some level open to interpretation as symbols or imagery pulled from the culture, wouldn't the description of unclean food also be open to that same interpretation? Okay, as a thought experiment, let's suppose this, this prophecy really is talking about the literal eating of pigs and mice. If that's true, what would it mean for followers of Jesus today? Would it mean that we're under the entire law of Moses? No. This prophecy doesn't even teach that the entirety of the kosher food laws will be, will be active. If we want to read it literally, Isaiah only mentions two animals. But for the sake of argument, let's suppose this was Isaiah's shorthand way of telling us that in the last days, the kosher food laws as a whole will be enforced. So does it follow then that Christians today are under those kosher food laws? No. In fact, because of what the New Testament teaches, it can't mean that. The author of the Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus declared all foods clean. And by the way, Jesus never commanded anyone to eat kosher. 1 Corinthians says we can eat anything we want from the meat market. Colossians 2 says we shouldn't let people judge us by what we eat or drink. Romans 14 says that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, and that all foods are clean because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including all the food, right? The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 gave new Gentile believers no greater burden than four restrictions, none of which were about unclean animals. So Christians today aren't obligated to keep a kosher diet. I mean, we can eat that way if we want, but it's not required of us. So even under a literal interpretation of Isaiah 66, the most we can conclude is that in the last days, some level of dietary restrictions may be enforced by God. But in the meantime, we're under no such restrictions. So here's the bottom line on Old Testament prophecies that, that seem to suggest that the law of Moses will be kept in the last days. Two things. First of all, none of them teach that the entire law will be in effect. And second, even if some particular aspect of the Mosaic law will be renewed in the last days, it has no bearing on the commands that Christians live under today, which is why it's very dangerous to build our theology entirely or even primarily on end times prophecies. This issue is really popular with those who are, let's say, predisposed to conspiracy theories. It's a fundamental part of the theology of the, the black Hebrew Israelites. And my friend in Spain tells me that the gypsy community in Europe is fond of claiming that they're descendants of the lost tribes as well. So one viewer, Jude Michael Velez, asked about it this way. Good day, Mr. Solberg. Uh, I'd like to request an in-depth scriptural exposition on the 10 lost tribes of Israel because my brother is a Torahist, and this is his go-to argument, uh, in dealing that he is not a Gentile, but is one of the lost tribes of Israel, therefore is a Jew, therefore obligated to follow the Torah, <clears throat> not unto salvation, but as an expression of his love for God, yet eating pork will send you to hell. <laughs> Thanks and shalom. So thanks, Jude. So as far as the lost tribes of Israel, this idea has been around for centuries in various forms, and it feels like every claim under the sun has been made about it. I mean, British Israelism claims that the lost tribes of Israel somehow eventually ended up in the British Isles, and then the British colonists who came to America are their descendants, and therefore Britain and or America are the new Israel. <laughs> The Mormons believe that Christ appeared and taught in the Americas several hundred years after his resurrection in order to minister to the descendants of the lost ten tribes in the Western Hemisphere. Others have claimed that the ten tribes migrated eastward through Asia and over the Bering Strait to become the Indian tribes, the Native American tribes of North and South America. And there's literature in Finland from the 1700s where the Finns, the Laps, and the Estonians are identified as coming from the lost tribes of Israel. And the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam believes that after surviving the crucifixion, because they believe Jesus, Jesus wasn't really killed on the cross, after surviving the crucifixion, Jesus went to the descendants of the tribes of Israel in Afghanistan and Kashmir.
And back in the 1600s, a Hebrew scholar from Amsterdam named Manasseh ben Israel claimed that he had discovered the lost 10 tribes in Ecuador. And as I mentioned, the black Hebrew Israelite movement believes that it is blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans today who are the true Israelites. And, and they believe that white people, or conventionally accepted Jews, aren't members of the tribes. And ironically, on the opposite end of the race spectrum, the white supremacist group Christian Identity Movement claims that it's white Anglo-Saxon people who are the rightful descendants of the lost tribe of Israel. So everyone's trying to get in on the game. There are a lot of claims out there, and they certainly can't all be correct. And the fact is, there is no historical evidence in support of any of these claims. These are conspiracy theories that are born and, and grow in the fuzzy fringes of documented history. But more important than history, let's look at what the Bible says about this. For those of you who don't know what the Lost Tribes of Israel are all about, it's an idea based on the fact that the House of Israel, the, the 12 tribes, were divided into two kingdoms around 975 BC. So this was after King Solomon died and during the reign of his son, King Rehoboam, where there was this long period of unrest and infighting led to this, this split. So the 12 tribes divided with the 10 tribes forming a northern kingdom that was called Israel, or sometimes scripture refers to it as Ephraim. And then the southern kingdom, which consisted of the other two tribes, which is, is called Judah. So 2 Kings 17 tells us that the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom were conquered by Assyria and carried away into captivity where they, where they intermarried with various other peoples. Now, the Bible doesn't teach this, but legend holds that these 10 tribes were then lost to history and assimilated into other people groups. And this is where we get all these conspiracy theories. So what does the Bible tell us about those 10 tribes? Well, according to scripture, they were never really lost. In 2 Chronicles, we read that after Assyria defeated the Northern Kingdom, many of the Israelites actually stayed in the land and reunited with Judah in the South. And then in a sort of Game of Thrones power play, Assyria, who had conquered the 10 tribes, was then itself conquered by Babylon. So about 120 years after the northern kingdom fell, Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. So in 597 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem and took 10,000 Jews captive, and he exiled them all to Babylon. And by the way, this deportation of Jews included the priest Ezekiel, whose, whose book we just read from. So that exile would have also included those Israelites from the northern kingdom who had reunited with Judah. And together, all of these Jews remained in exile in Babylon for 70 years until King Cyrus allowed them to, to return to Jerusalem to rebuild it. So we have good reason to believe that Jews from all 12 tribes returned to Jerusalem to rebuild their city. And the rest of the Bible bears this out. For example, 700 years after the supposed loss of the 10 tribes, Luke introduces us to a prophetess named Anna, who was from one of those lost tribes, Asher. And when the Apostle Paul made his defense before Agrippa, he said this, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope, notice the present tense, hope to attain as they earnestly worship, again, present tense, as they earnestly worship night and day. So Paul's speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel as if they were very much alive and known in his time. And James, the brother of Jesus, addressed his epistle to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So James not only thought the 12 tribes still existed, but he actually wrote a letter to them. And Jesus told Peter and the disciples that in the last days, you, you, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the book of Revelation tells us that in the end times, there will be people sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And it lists 12 tribes by name. And when seeing a vision of the new Jerusalem, the apostle John wrote, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. So the idea that the 10 tribes of Israel were lost is a false legend, not a biblical fact. God knows where all the 12 tribes are, and the Bible says that all 12 of them will play a role in his kingdom in the last days. This is another theory that's been floating around out there that I hear quite a bit. 
It's actually one of the false ideas that Rabbi Singer promotes in his attacks on Christianity. I think we actually touched on this issue in, in my debate with him. And it's also a theory suggested by the more radical Torah keepers because so much of what Paul wrote contradicts their theology. So in an effort to, to defend their Hebrew roots views, some will try to dismiss Paul as the inventor of what we know today as Christianity and say we only need to follow the words of Jesus in the four gospels. A viewer who goes by the name Nunu submitted five questions to me and number five was this one. How would you respond to someone who claims Paul was the real founder of Christianity? And Sean H. thought that was a good question. So, did the Apostle Paul invent Christianity? No. Paul didn't invent Christianity. He stumbled into it. Christianity predates Paul. And I say this for two reasons. First, when we first meet Paul in Scripture under his Hebrew name Saul, he was persecuting followers of Jesus. Early Jewish believers in Yeshua were were spreading the news about the the resurrected Jewish Messiah in the synagogues, which made the Jewish religious leaders angry and caused Paul to actively persecute followers of Jesus. Acts 8 tells us, But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And just before Paul met the risen Christ, we, we read this, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, and before belief in Jesus was called Christianity, it was called the way, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And in Paul's own words, he says that before he met Jesus... I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. So Christianity as a belief system existed before Paul came to faith in Jesus and started writing about it. And second, even skeptical scholars like Bart Ehrman acknowledge that by the time Paul had his conversion, there was already a body of data circulating called the early creeds. These early creeds were were the short, easily memorizable statements that contain the foundation of Christian theology. They teach the the deity and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul cited these early creeds in his epistles. You'll find them in 1 Corinthians 15 and and 1 Timothy 3 and, and Philippians 2. So both belief in Jesus and the core of Christian theology existed before Paul became a Christian. And remember that after his conversion, Paul did ministry with with many of the disciples and apostles who personally knew Jesus and had learned directly from the Messiah. So although Paul was one of the men that God used to teach his people the the theological significance of the ministry of Christ and, and what the new covenant and the gospel means for us, Paul was in no position to make things up that, that contradicted what Jesus taught. I mean, think about it. Peter, John, James, John Mark, Matthew, and the rest would have jumped all over Paul and kicked him out as a false teacher if he were trying to teach against what they personally heard Jesus say. But what we see in the New Testament is the opposite. Peter, who was with Jesus since the beginning of his earthly ministry, Peter even refers to Paul's epistles as scripture. So no, Paul didn't invent or distort Christianity. He encountered it, and God used him to teach it and to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And here's the thing. If your theology requires you to dismiss certain parts of Scripture or reject certain biblical authors, you're teaching a heresy. And it's not the Bible you believe, but yourself. Okay, many of you know that I'm a musician and have asked me stuff about it, and one of the most common questions I get is what kind of music do I listen to? And a couple people have, a- have even specifically asked about my Spotify 2022 wrap-up. So I logged in to check it out, and for those of you who find this stuff interesting, here are my results. Turns out my top artists this year were Bach and Mozart and a couple of film composers and a singer-songwriter named Josh Garrels. Have you heard of this guy? He's amazing, such a great artist. So original, uh, beautiful lyrics, amazing vocals, super original production. I highly recommend his album, Chrysaline. It's brilliant. 
I was actually introduced to him by one of my theology students this year, and now he's become like one of my favorite artists. So thanks, Cassandra. And let me give you one more album recommendation that I just love and wore out this year. It's called Bach Trios, and it features three monster musicians. So you've got Yo-Yo Ma on cello, Edgar Meyer on double bass, and then you'd, you'd think the third member of the trio would be a violinist, right? Nope, it's mandolin, played by Chris Thiele from, from Nickel Creek. So he plays a classical mandolin part, and it really works. It's brilliant. Whew. Okay. So that's going to be it for today's Q&A. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. I hope you found something here helpful. Shalom.